Welcome to the Monkey's Pad Podcast, Episode 1. I'd like to welcome the first guest to the Monkey's Pad, Andrew Sandoval, author and Monkey's historian. Hi, Andrew. Hey, everybody. Andrew, tell us how this book differs from the version you did 15 years ago, The Monkey's Day by Day. It's a, it's a greatly rewritten and expanded version of the book, because originally I was just going to expand the original book, do some corrections and things. But what happened was I, I stumbled on a lot more material than I had anticipated, and then even integrating the basic material that I had, I found that the story of the monkeys was uh, changed a great deal from what I learned in the process of the research over the last 18 months or so. So it's 732 pages, and it spans the years 1942 through 1970. And, uh, you know, basically from Peter Tork's birth to Michael Nesmith's last gig of 1970, which was at Disneyland. And... In between, you know, covers all of the monkeys' recording sessions, who played on the sessions, the engineers, the songwriters, many of whom I talked to, uh, also the shooting dates from the TV show, wherever I could uh, find call sheets and other information about that. Shooting for Head, I had all the uh, shooting breakdown for that and a lot of uh, camera rolls to actually line up with what the shooting schedule was with the physical film. Um, I also had physical camera reels for the taping of the 33 and a third revolutions per monkey special I tracked down radio appearances. I tracked down live gigs uh, that they did from 66 through 69 and even into 70. And then also Michael Nesmith's solo gigs and the pre monkeys solo gigs, M Mickey Dolan's at a club or Davy Jones on stage in a play or Peter Tork performing uh, solo before and after the monkeys. So, I have pretty much the whole range of information that you want. It's the complete monkey's chronicle of those years, uh, day by day. Now, this is something that you yourself are manufacturing and publishing. So the way to get this book is probably a little bit different than people are used to going on Amazon. Could you tell us a little bit about how this process is going to be for this book to get it? Yeah, it's a totally different process, and it's something um, – let me switch off that so we don't hear that during the interview. <laughs> um, it's a totally different process, which is probably unique. I'm maybe one of the first people to do something like this, but it's all based on a pre-order system, but it's not even a pre-order. It's a reservation because it's so hard to tell with the monkey's audience just how many people there are out there. I mean, sometimes we'll put out a release and they'll instantly sell out, and other times it'll be kind of a slow seller. So since I'm totally self-financing this and self-publishing it, and it's such a vast, large book that's hard to store, um, that, uh, you know, a quantity of, it's not hard if you've got one copy of it to have in your home, but if I had to have a thousand extra copies, if I had made a thousand extra copies, I would be in real trouble, I think. So the, the situation is you go to my website, beatlandbooks.com, and you look at the different options. There's three different options for different versions of the book that I'm putting out. All three of them basically have the same information, but they're different packaging for the three versions. And you choose which ones you want. You can choose just one, or you could choose all three, or you could choose two or whatever, or multiple copies of, of a specific one that you want. And that gives me the idea of how many that I'm going to make. I'm going to make a specific amount just for the people who have signed up. And if you don't sign up and you say, hey, I don't feel good about this, I, I'm going to wait, I don't know that I'll have books for you. I may eventually have some leftover books, but they probably will be at a higher price than the people who are reserving now because uh, they are very expensive to make and – uh, there's a whole other myriad of reasons why. So what we're, what we're going to do after the reservation period is closed is we're going to take a wait list of people, you know, because there'd be people who were not on the internet for the last few weeks seeing me inundate people with this information. They'll say, hey, I didn't find out. So we will take down your name. We'll take down which one you want or give you some options. And if anybody flakes out on their reservation, you'll be bumped at the list basically just in the order uh, just like if you were reserving a table at a restaurant, you're 
reserving a monkey's book. So we're going to try and accommodate everybody, but I can't afford personally to keep the book in print perpetually or do it in a traditional way where I just say, well, I think there might be a thousand monkeys fans. I'll make a thousand of these super expensive, huge books and see what happens. Um, I want to know specifically what people want. And I made this book for the monkeys fans. I'm a monkey fan. And That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to make something. So I want to uh, tailor it to, to the people's uh, desires. So. What are the differences between the three versions? Well, the uh, basic version is called flexi bound and it's basically a softback edition of the book. It still has all 732 pages, uh, but the cover itself is a flexi. Uh, what you're showing there now is the slip cover that will be on the deluxe version of the book, which is a hardback book, uh, which will be uh, covered in yellow cloth with the red monkeys logo uh, that you see there on the front. And then uh, it'll have a dust jacket on it, a paper dust jacket, and it'll slip inside of this blue slip cover. Now it's beautiful uh, artwork. So what we decided was for the super deluxe edition, you will get this artwork on the cover of uh, an additional 32 page photo book that will be included with the super deluxe and with no other edition of the book. It won't have any extra added information that you're going to be missing out on if you do the lower end books. So that uh, was the second level tier. That was the second tier book that we just saw. Right. So the top level to your book will be uh, completely cloth bound in red with a yellow monkeys uh, logo across the front. It's going to be in a clamshell. And then if you open up the flap in inside, there'll be another book. The, the main book will be sitting on here uh, and it'll be hardback with paper jacket and you'll have the two books and the, uh, the other book will be suspended on the inside with some nice little, uh, uh, you know, sort of satin marker things. And the book itself will have bookmarks because it's such a big book and there'll be a yellow bookmark and a red bookmark. So you can have two places marked in the book. Does this come with an insurance policy that should anyone get hernia from lifting it, uh, there'll be some insurance coverage available? You know, it, it might, but I, I really didn't want the book to be this long, to be honest. I had, I had, well, the fans did. The yeah. Fans. I, had, I was, Initially, I was like, oh, the book will be 500 pages. It'll be great. And then it was like, oh, the book, okay, it'll top out at 600. It'll be great. And what happened was we we kept finding more and more information and, and just to have it so it wasn't, you know, you don't, I didn't have to make a monkey's microscope to read it too. Uh, you know, want to give the book its due. And, you know, as I told people what was going to be in the book, uh, I did approach some publishers and they were like, this is a great idea, Andrew. You know, you cut out 300 pages and make a normal like 400 page book and you could sell a lot of those books. People will love it. And I was like, well, that's not really what I want to do. I mean, even if it means that there's a whole audience of maybe a few thousand people who don't want to read this because it's more than they want. It's the core audience that I've been writing for, for all these years. I want to do a book just for them. And I, I'm, it's not like a, an elitist thing or trying to cut anybody out, but I didn't want to have to sacrifice all the details just to sort of aim at a uh, wider audience because that's what I've had to do over the years with a lot of the monkeys records I've done. Rhino has said to me, look, Andrew, uh, we can't do four discs of uh, headquarters. It's gotta be three, you know, cause we don't think people are going to spend more than $60 on this headquarters session thing. And you know, they have, they have their experience in there and they're the ones funding it. They own the material. They have every right to say how they want things. I personally own the rights to this book. It's been my life's work. I've spent 30 years researching it. So in that sense, I want to do it a certain way. And rather than the people say, well, why not do just an electronic version? It'll be very cheap. Everybody can copy it and share it and give it to everybody else and whatever. I was like, no, this actually is my intellectual property. I'd like it treated a certain way in my it's life. It's not the same. It's not the same <laughs> from having a, a big, beautiful deluxe uh, coffee table edition with beautiful print photographs and textured right. buying. It's just not the same. I get that it's convenient, but you know, what ends up happening financially, it's, it's unpleasant to mention it, but it's like I'm subsidizing everybody else reading this because as you know, you've collected some amazing monkeys things over the years, but to get these rare pieces of material, it's usually not like, $20 or $50. It's thousands of dollars. Thousands. Sure. But 
I'm not hoping to make back my money on all of that, but I also don't want to devalue it by saying it's all free now. Uh, you know, the, 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 the value of all of this stuff that is, uh, is just, uh, it's a dollar now. And I, a, a lot of artwork has been devalued, unfortunately. And I'm in a position where I can present it uh, in this really beautiful way. And the monkeys have been treated very poorly by a lot of record labels and reissue labels, all kinds of people over the years it, it, singing like the monkeys fans, they, they don't want anything too nice or classy. You know, I mean, you look at like the Lori house record, the horrible artwork and all these <laughs> other things, you oh, know, boy. the monkeys, the monkeys. Remember never, when that came in the mail, boy, that was a shocker. Yeah. They've never been treated like the Beatles or any of their contemporaries who they, they are on a par with for, for a lot of us. So I wanted to elevate them to that level, treat them, with that kind of respect. Well, I mean, let's be, let's be, let's be honest. You have been doing that for about roughly 30 years now. I mean, there isn't a, a, a reissue uh, that you haven't had your hand in that hasn't elevated their quality. I mean, it really was when, well, I guess when Rhino took over the monkey's catalog that they really started getting the respect that they deserved up until then. It was just, uh, you know, the Arista greatest hits really before that. Yeah, truly that. And, and you know, it's because the people at Rhino were Monkees fans, just like I am, the people who founded it. If you go back in my book in 1970, uh, we were just finishing laying that out. And, you know, it opens up with some quotes from an uh, interview that Harold Bronson did with Michael Nesmith in June of 1970. And, I mean, his fandom of them goes back to that. He started talking with the Monkees. He wrote an article in Coast Magazine, I think, around 1971. And he was really fascinated by the Monkey story. And and so, you know, he brought that forward with the monkeys to the point where eventually he bought the monkeys catalog in 1994 uh, with Warner Music and with Rhino. And, and I was involved in that purchase. But it's really interesting that all the monkeys fans have decided to take this thing kind of over and take it to a new place. And um, it's kind of beautiful in a way. It's, it's a really poetic thing that the fans didn't want it to die. And, um, and they all saw the value in it that the screen gems and Columbia pictures and all these other people didn't really, you know, it's just another little thing to them. So. Right. Well, when, when, how, what's the, what's the story of how it went from screen gems, Columbia pictures owning it, where it was basically left in the dustbin to Rhino acquiring it. What's the story of how you, because if you hadn't uh, acquired it, it'd be a different ball game today, probably. The, the, yeah, very you know, much the so. level of resurgence might not have happened. The music might not be getting appreciated the way it's getting appreciated. I mean, a lot has happened because they lost the property. It's been to the Monkees fans' advantage and to their advantage. How? What's the story behind that? Well, it's a very interesting story. I'm glad you asked because no one else has really ever asked me about that. And what it is is that uh, Bob Rafelson and Bert Schneider, despite the fact that they sort of bowed out of – uh, their sort of overall management of the monkeys in late 1968 when the movie Head came out. Um, they sort of took, a, took took themselves back out of it, and then they got involved in producing the movie Easy Rider and then Five Easy Pieces. They, they dissolved Raybird Productions in 1970 and renamed it BBS, and they took on Steve Blauner, who was involved in the monkeys TV series for Screen Gems. And... Over the years, the, Bert Schneider had uh, followed this uh, thread with the monkeys and felt that the monkeys weren't properly treated by Columbia Pictures. He had worked for Columbia Pictures. His father used to run Columbia Pictures. But he also, being from the inside, loved to be an agitator of Columbia Pictures. I spoke to somebody. Uh, Columbia Pictures was then bought by Sony uh, and became Sony Pictures. Right. I spoke to somebody who worked for Sony Pictures and had a great story about Bert. He was being deposed in a lawsuit, and they said, well, what's your occupation, Mr. Schneider? And he said, I sue Sony Pictures. That's, that's what I do for a living. <laughs> so he was always advocating on behalf of the monkeys. He was quite a monkeys fan. Uh, the last phone conversation I ever had with him, he said, you know, Andrew, I'm a monkeys fan. Now you, need to know, you need to know that. So he, he, uh, what he did was he, he set up like the – the marathon M MTV, he's the one who brokered that deal. He's the one who said, if the monkeys are to be relaunched, it needs to be through this medium. And he did that. So that was one of the things. But getting on to the sale, what happened was he was approached by, I believe, Criterion Collection uh, to do a, at the time, it was a laser disc of Easy Rider. This is how long ago it was. And they said, 
hey, we do these great things with commentaries and we add extra deleted scenes and other things and uh, you own the movie. So, cause it was produced and distributed. It was distributed by Columbia Pictures, but owned by Ray Burt slash BBS. And Burt said, yes, we do. So we have everything. We own everything on that. We'll go get our stuff. It's being stored by Columbia Pictures slash Sony for us as a favor to us. Cause my dad runs the company, you know, or used to. And when they went to retrieve all of the trims and outtakes and other things to do with Easy Rider, Columbia said, oh, we destroyed all that extra stuff uh, because, uh, you know, you never came to collect it. Well, that's going to cost you. Yeah. So Bert Schneider said, well, you didn't own that. It wasn't yours to destroy. You mm. contractually had no rights to do that. So I'm suing you now. And over the course of a number of years of suing them, they made a settlement. And the settlement was – we're going to give you back the rights to the monkeys. Uh, but they probably thought wasn't much of a, a, a giveaway at the time, probably. It was probably no. uh, like giving them a penny stock. Exactly. So, it, and, and there were only certain rights. Sony still retains the rights to show the, the TV show on uh, broadcast television and cable and things, which a lot of people don't get. They always think, why isn't Rhino getting this show on TV? And they don't know that that has nothing to do with Rhino. Um, so, what Bert got was he got all of the monkeys original recordings released and unreleased. And at one time they were split up. Arista had all the released recordings and Columbia pictures, Sony pictures would license Rhino stuff like live in 67 or missing links. That was a separate license. So they said, we're going to get it all back. We'll get it all back from Arista, which had been taken over by, Be which was a takeover from bell and, all of it's back to you, Bert and Bob and Steve Blauner. It was all back to BBS as a settlement. And then all the 58 episodes, you have the rights to broadcast those on home video or stream them or show them theatrically. They're yours. Television special 33 and a third, it's yours. Head, we, we made that. Columbia Pictures funded it. It's yours. Columbia Pictures kept every single outtake and trim for that. They have all that. So um, what happened was then Bert and Bob and Steve started uh, shopping that catalog. This is around 93, 94 and looking for a home. And um, they had gone to Michael Nesmith initially and said, do you want to buy the catalog? You know, you're well off and you're one of the monkeys. You know, this might be a nice gesture to, to you that you'd have control over some of your uh, stuff. And I think he said, well, he didn't want Davey calling him in the middle of the night looking, looking for royalties or that he didn't want to get into, involved in like Peter calling him up and, and then Mickey and all these, you know, being in the middle of the business and being in charge of it. I think it's he, best it didn't happen that way. Yeah. So he said, no, I don't want, because, and also and then Pacific Arts went under uh, because of the PBS deal, you know, PBS defrauded uh, Pacific Arts. There's all these complicated legal things you learn about in the story. It's kind of fascinating. And Nesbitt so, got millions of dollars from that, didn't he? He did. He did. It was a, an amazing thing. He was able to prove in court that they conspired against him to basically, um, you know, collapse his company because they felt they could do better elsewhere. So it was kind of a terrible thing that happened. And he, he managed to recover from that in some way. But Pacific Arts went under, uh, as it was then. Now there's still a Pacific Arts. There's Video Ranch. And he runs... Uh, what he calls the Nesmith companies. He's got a, a variety of different companies that do different things. So, um, so Rhino seemed like a, a likely candidate. And even then, um, when they were discussing it with me, they said, well, the monkeys are so cold. Do you really think it's worth this money to buy it? And uh, ultimately they decided uh, with the help of Warner Music, who they were about to be completely bought out by, um, that they, they got a loan and they, they bought the monkeys catalog. So that happened in 1994, and I was sat there in the at the at, in the room when they handed over the check to Bert, Bob, and Steve, and they said, you know, Andrew, ask any questions that you have of these guys. This is the last time, you know, uh, you're going to be involved in this, you know, find out. And I was like, hey, well, what about the extra footage of Head? And, and Bob Riffson said, we we had a tough enough time stringing together what we had out of that. What do you mean extra footage? Go oh, away, kid. You bother me. I heard, I heard that you showed a super long version of the movie and then you cut it down. Uh, no, not true. So, so anyway.
truth you found the truth you found out the truth later what yes. what exists of head and what was is dying from uh, vinegar uh, decomposition well just about everything is dying from vinegar decomposition for head unfortunately it's in really bad shape and i haven't seen any of the film reels for geez i guess it's been almost 20 years now so um um no, 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 sorry. It's been about um, 11 years. Sorry, wrong. Uh, it was 2010 that I saw all the stuff, but they had all the trims and outtakes, and um, some of the stuff, I mean, the most amazing thing was when Mike goes to the mirror and says, hey, now wait a minute, now wait just a minute after the kissing contest. There's a big cut in the movie, and that's where you see all those TV screens come up. Well, initially what happens, uh, which I saw on the film, is that, he looks into the mirror and then he sees an alter ego of himself as the Marlboro man dressed in cowboy outfit. And then Mickey goes to the mirror and then he sees himself as Puck and Peter goes to the mirror and he sees himself as Pagliacci. And then Davey goes to the mirror and he's like Errol Flynn. And this whole section is all these fast cuts. Like you'd see in the monkeys TV, TV series, it was all strung together and edited and stuff. And I said, Oh, I, I want to get this done. And they said, well, it's so badly shrunken. It's going to need to be restored. It's going to cost them. $1,200 or something like that. And so Criterion, who I was working for at the time, went to Rafelson and he said, absolutely not. It wasn't even the money. He's like, I don't want any of this other stuff. So if no. you had a fundraiser help restore head and you got uh, $20,000, it wouldn't have helped. Well, at the time it might've helped because uh, Rhino could have said, okay, we're going to preserve this. So I went to the person who was running Rhino at the time. And one of his least favorite bands was the monkeys. <laughs> he was rather embarrassed, I think, that the Monkees were uh, one of the bands on his label. He he felt that the label could have a much better identity doing Broadway show tunes uh, and and, and uh, new new cast recordings and film soundtracks and other things. He wanted to rebrand the company and get it away from the Dr. Demento Monkees world that it had been. A lot of people don't realize that Rhino hasn't been that for decades. It, they're not that company of the 1980s anymore, and they haven't been for 30 years. So um, it's tough for people. They, they're like, how come they're not putting out the novelty records anymore? It's like they haven't done that in years. They don't put out the multi-artist box sets. They don't do a lot of stuff. They focus on the stuff that's on roster uh, from the Warner catalog, and even that, there's a lot of stuff that's like we don't want to deal with it. Or give it to Friday Music or some other place. Uh, so – this guy said, hey, there's this historic footage of the monkeys. I need $10,000 or whatever. And he was like, no. The monkeys, we can't make that money back. No. So the stuff went back into the dustbin of history. It went back into storage. And um, what had been, what I had rescued up to that point was saved. And when we did the Blu-ray box, every little bit that I had gotten before Bob Rafelson pulled the plug on the restoration of that stuff, I used on the Blu-ray box. It did come out. So everybody has it. When I was doing the Blu-ray box, though, I did find, uh, with Dan Wingate, all of these canisters of uh, of shooting for the, the movie in perfect, unlike all the Finnegar Syndrome stuff, this was perfectly preserved. It was just in immaculate condition. I actually made, I got all of that transferred. However, it doesn't have sound to it. So we did some vignettes on the uh, Blu-ray uh, with, you know, some, some, uh, you know, some of the best shots from that, but there's hours of it. Well, the Blu-ray is a masterful achievement. I mean, um, I don't know what the hell happened with that thing that it disappeared so quickly. Uh, I think I heard you say something about they lost the ship, ship uh, half of them, uh, the pressings are yeah. missing somewhere. How yeah. on earth does that happen? Well, I don't, you know, that's, it's, once you produce a project, uh, if people always ask me, how did this master tape get lost? Or how did that end up in some private collection or whatever? Wow. That's un, you know, unthinkable. It's like when you're done with the project, you know, usually the last thing you're thinking about is where are all of the assets? Um, there are sometimes people at companies who are in charge of, okay, we've got to find where all the tapes are and get all the stuff into the vault. But that doesn't always happen. Sometimes they just end up like whoever the last person to turn out the lights in the building is, you know, ends up with stuff. So, um, 
what happened with that was uh, Rhino moved its fulfillment to a, a, a central source, this place called Direct Shot. And there's all these company, uh, these stories you can look up online. It's not just with the monkeys, it's with all kinds of products. Where Direct Shot does stuff for all of the major labels and they're all like, Where, where's our stuff? Because it's just some massive fulfillment center that's shooting out stuff. And so maybe they'll find them someday, there'll be a warehouse discovery. But what happened was the monkeys Blu-ray sold okay at the beginning, but it was a massive uh, investment from, it was a joint venture actually between Sony Pictures and Rhino. It was something that a deal that I got struck uh, between the two parties because uh, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to restore the shows. And I, I, don't, I think a lot of the fans was kind of lost on them. They were kind of feeling, well, unless this thing has every variation of every soundtrack that was ever on the show, and unless somebody comes over and orders me a pizza and gives me a back rub while I watch it, it's not worth $200. Um, what they didn't. Yeah, I was I was surprised at some of the the uh, cynical comments that were being made at the time about the cost of it with two hundred dollars, which to me I think the disc ten was worth two hundred dollars by itself personally. Yeah, I, I felt so too. I invested more than two hundred dollars in disc ten. I bought a lot of footage that's on there and I gave to the thing for free. But um, the the reality was that the the res restoration of the episodes was such a significant cost getting those 58 episodes done from the original uh, 35 millimeters, plus finding the 35 millimeter pilot of the, the unaired pilot. I mean, that was the big deal, but people felt, well, you know, the box wasn't glued right. You know, you should have been at the factory. My uh, booklets bent, you know, uh, you, you know, you promoted this and now you, you left us high and dry here, Andrew. So it was, it, it was a very unfortunate situation. I mean, my main work on that was that, I got this deal between these two parties to invest the most money in the monkeys that had been invested since the 1960s. It was about $350,000 that the two parties invested to restore the show and have it preserved so it wouldn't be like head. It wouldn't be decaying. And um, I, I don't want to meddle for that, but I think people were misguided in their thought that somehow for $200, you know, th 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 that they were really screwed. Now you have to pay six hundred dollars to get it off of eBay. So right, exactly. I, you know, I always tell people with these handmade things, you think that we're you know taking advantage of you, charging you sixty dollars for three discs full of unreleased material or you know a, a lot of stuff that if you went to a swap meet, you'd be paying some guy three hundred dollars for it. And and what happens is they all end up selling out, and all the third party vendors come in, and good for them. They bought the stuff, and. Right. Um, I feel bad though, because I know a lot of people are struggling and hurting, and a lot of people are work. I've been out of work really for the last year with the monkeys not touring, and uh, I downsize. You know, I'm here in a second bedroom instead of an office doing my work these days, and uh, you know, trying to stay healthy so I can finish and maybe one day go back outside again. But it, it's it, it's tough. I think the big picture of what I have to deal with to get products out is lost on a lot of the audience um, because they don't understand sometimes compromises have to be made just to move forward you know right. rhino has to be happy the monkeys have to be happy uh you know it's less about what i want and what the fans want sometimes and it's more about do we want all 58 episodes restored or are we going to be involved in 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 every you know every little thing um rhino specifically with that box set said Look, you're producing this uh, tour. You're involved in Good Times. Uh, you know, you're doing all these other projects, all in 2016. We're not going to allow you to solely produce the Blu-ray box. You can't. We don't want you to. You have to let go of it and let other people be involved. So I did. Hmm. Huh, huh. And it's fair. You know, I mean, there. It's their money. It wasn't my. I didn't invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in it. Um, and, but a lot of people don't get that. They just think that, you know, um, I let them down and I feel bad about that. I literally spent years feeling bad about it, but I don't feel bad now. So. Well, that's the kind of lesson to be learned about your book also, because uh, your book is even much more limited of a, of a pressing probably than that was. Yeah, it is. And, um, and I learned my lesson from the Blu-ray box in a way, um, because 
we made, I think, 10,000 Blu-ray boxes, <clears throat> and only maybe half of those were sold. So um, I didn't want to be uh, sitting on 5,000 extra Blu-ray boxes because financially it worked out, okay, I invested this much time and money and bought these photos and paid off you know, these people to do this and that. Uh, so I'm going to have to make this many in order to make it uh, this affordable for the general monkeys audience. I had to say, here's reality. There's maybe a thousand or 2000 tops people who are going to want to buy a 700 page book on the monkeys, no matter how good it is, no matter how many unpublished photos there are, no matter how much recording session information you found that you didn't have before, no matter how many unpublished interviews, no matter, you know, the, the re complete retelling of the Don Kirshner, Beverly Hills Hotel story completely changed, but firsthand in the voice of the monkeys and Don Kirshner himself from the time period, all this new information, it doesn't matter. It's like how many people realistically are going to want to do this and not just get it for free on the internet. And so that's, that's why the book prices are, are what they are. And that's why I'm doing it at this sort of limited inventory thing. So I'm satisfying the demand of the people who want it now. If you want it later and you want to buy it off eBay for three, four times the price, I, I gave everybody a full month to figure out what they want to do. And, and then didn't take any money from anybody. I've given them also more time, like not going to bill anybody till May. So I, I, it's the most generous thing I can do. So if people need a little time to save money to pay for the book, if they reserve it now, they won't be billed until the book is ready to ship in June. Is that correct? Right. You're just reserve. You're just registering your interest um, on the book. Um, this is something sort of similar to like Genesis publications do these beautiful books on the Beatles and related artists. And I've always been a fan of those. Those are quite a bit more expensive than my book. You'd be, you know, you think, oh man, your book's expensive. Look on, look on Genesis. Those are six, seven hundred dollars, aren't exactly. they? Exactly. Yeah, and they're you know coming from England and whatnot. They're beautiful books though, and they all hold their value. I believe this monkey's book will hold its value, and you'll be very pleased. It's not a book you're going to read overnight. It's a book that's meant to you know to enjoy for the rest of your life. You'll pick through it and find new stuff. It's it's the product of decades of, of research. So I'm really you know I I'm pretty sure you're going to like it. And there's going to be a lot of photographs in there nobody has seen. We know that. Even you. <laughs> You've seen some of the greatest photos. I mean, you're always surprising me with stuff you dig out. And, um, yeah, there, I think, I mean, you're one of my audience. You know, it's, I want to surprise you, you know, with some stuff uh, that I've, you know, that I've managed to find. Well, I think, I think, I, I heard rumblings. There's some really rare 33 and a third photos in there, which are very scarce. Yeah, um, there's a few of those. There's uh, I found photos of the monkeys on Jerry's place, the Jerry Blavitt show promoting Head. Uh, there's photos inside the monkeys nightclub in uh, New Jersey. One of the few of those. Uh, there's there's a lot of uh, recording session photos. Andrew, I know Mickey was really big into photography during the monkeys days, and he took a lot of pictures during those years. Uh, does he still have those photos? Do you know? And is uh, there any chance that maybe they might become available for the fans to see in some kind of project? Yeah. Well, the good news is that Mickey has been very careful and kept everything. And um, we've been slowly archiving everything these last couple of years. Actually, we were in Australia. Uh, the last Monkey State that was played was at the Sydney Opera House. And we were at a airport lounge or something. He said, you know, Andrew, when we get home, I've decided it's time finally, like, I want you to, you know, get all the 16 millimeters uh, transferred to HD, and then I noticed he had the he had the photography too, because uh, you always saw him with the camera as well. So we've been going through all that stuff, and he's still deciding what he wants to do. But he's got loads of uh, um, films. He's got documents. He's got handwritten lyrics. He's got uh, he's got audio recordings that no one's ever heard demos and and other things so he's got a whole variety of stuff so we're talking about his main focus right now is he's got the stolen Saints nuzlik record which is another thing we worked on during lockdown and i was the a and r person for that so that's that's coming up next stolen Saints nuzlik and then maybe beyond that we'll see uh we'll see mickey's archive open up 
Isn't there also a, a Nesmith, unreleased Nesmith uh, RCA package coming out? Yeah, what that is, is it's not strictly unreleased, to be honest. Um, in 2018, Sony uh, put up digitally, we restored the first national band, second national band, and, and solo, all the RCA catalog uh, for digital, for streaming, but they didn't feel, Sony owns all that and didn't feel there was an audience for a physical product of it. But they allowed me to go through and find uh, any outtakes and things, and I mixed them. And so they've been up on YouTube and Spotify and all these places to listen to. But uh, this other company called Second Disc, uh, through Real Gone Music, said it'd be great to have a physical version of all of these previously unissued tracks. So they pulled all those from the different reissues, and uh, they are are coming out on this new disc. And the cool thing is that at Sony, they had all these unpublished Nesmith photos. So there's beautiful photos uh, of him in the nudie suit that we've never seen and other things. So that's kind of a cool release. I remember uh, a couple of years ago at the Monkees convention, you were airing a um, Voice and Heart documentary. Right. Whatever happened with that? Will there ever be a general release of that? <laughs> well, I don't know about that. It would take the an investment of like, I'm guessing $100,000, $150,000. Um, the movie was made by myself, uh, Rachel Lickman, and Bobby Hart. And we had one investor. Uh, we made the movie for like $15,000 or $20,000 or something insane. And it came out really well. But um, our problem was that to clear the rights to all the clips, you don't, have, you don't just clear the clip. You have to clear the publishing for the music. Yeah, and you have to clear the, the audio recording of the music as well. And it really adds up. And we got to a point where we just, we didn't have the money to clear those things. And we took it to Magnolia Pictures and all these other places that put out documentaries. And they just said, we're not feeling it. We, we like the documentary, but we don't know that there's an audience for this. So we just thought, oh, this is a mm -hmm. great story. So anybody who was lucky enough to see it, um, I'm glad, but people say, well, why can't you just put it up on YouTube? It's like, well, that would be completely illegal. And <sighs> primarily, Bobby Hart was the primary f footage owner because he had all that amazing unissued 8mm uh, and 16mm footage. And so it would be basically just devaluing all of his stuff. So, it, you know, fans don't like, well, why isn't this free? Why isn't just up for everybody to see? And those are the reasons. I mean, it's respecting the rights owners. Um, you know, they deserve to be respected. Yeah, well, it was great. Um, yeah, I guess uh, if you weren't there, you missed it. Yeah, unfortunately. Some things like that happen. I mean, you look back into the 1960s and you look at all these TV listings of all these things that don't exist anymore and you think, wow, wouldn't it have been amazing to see the monkeys on the Joey Bishop show? I mean, we have an audio recording, but what about the monkeys on Johnny Carson? And then I found out that the monkeys had been um, – on a TV show in Hawaii when they went to Hawaii in 1969 for, you know, half hour. And there was a TV special in Canada that I found out about from 69 uh, that was shot at the opening day of their 69 tour. Imagine wow. seeing them, you know, interviewed side stage and they got Sam with the good timers. I mean, it's, as far as we know, it's lost, but I found new details. I didn't just say, Hey, I did a good job 15 years ago. Stick that out again. I'll add on this, extra interview stuff, and we're done. I was like, this is an opportunity to go back to 1969, 1970, find out all this stuff I, I want to know, and I want to share it with people, you know? And so I had a, I had a real ball the last year uh, digging out all kinds of crazy stuff I knew nothing about. There's even a TV, a TV special in 68 that aired, like, in November on all these different stations called Monkey Special with no other uh, listing. And uh, it, it's just weird. And it showed in a lot of places. And it was not just the TV show. Never heard it of was that. An hour long. And I've asked people who were, you know, around the time, no one has any recollection. It wasn't shown in every market, but it was shown in lots of markets. So, because, uh, you know, TV was very regional back then, even if it's network, you know, it, it, it could have been rerunning a show. You see, 33 and a third was shown in Alaska like three months later. It was shown in, in you know, mainland uh, United States. It, there's all that weird stuff that's fun to get into, you know, which you can find a lot more about. Now. It's like the Sajid Khan television special that was on in some markets, but no one's, uh, remember Sajid Khan? I do. I do. And, uh,
He had a television special. I think Harper's Bazaar was one of the guests on it. He had I an album on Pearl Gems. Yes, um, I've got that was I've a got t- I would, singles. I would love to see what that looked like. Speaking was of Pearl Gems. Yeah, there, oh, oh, just to add to, onto that, there was a show, uh, a pilot that was shown in 1970 that had been produced the previous year in 69 that Don Kirshner and Jeff Barry were the music coordinators for called The Cowboys. And it was um, Michael Martin Murphy and Owens Castleman from the Lewis and Clark Expedition, who also wrote What Am I Doing Hanging Around and uh, Oklahoma Backroom Dancer and Texas Morning and the, these monkeys related songs. But they had a show called The Cowboys with a K. And uh, it was shown on TV. And I'd love to see that. I'd love to, because I love the Lewis and Clark expedition too. I just think that'd be kind of neat. Um, speaking of call gems, uh, I know you're, I mean, I've heard you say that actually it's the Beatles that's your favorite band, which uh, <laughs> I'd love to hear Sorry, about folks. that. Because if the monkeys <laughs> aren't your favorite band, then you've got something that tops that. I want to hear about it. But um, you're probably familiar with uh, Bruce Spizer's books. On sure. the, uh, on all the Beatles albums and singles, and he's done exhaustive uh, research on every detail about the releases, the production of the records, the labels, the foreign, into, you know. How, why is Call Gems such a mystery? I mean, there is no information on that label. I've never seen any documentation, paperwork. I mean, Call Gems was somewhat of a vanity label, uh, meaning it was it was really created just for the Monkees records initially by Don Kirshner with RCA. And there were other labels before RCA that wanted to uh, sign the Monkees. The Monkees auditioned for other uh, labels. And, you know, that had been uh, around, there had been talk about that in the past, but I actually found a schedule with an audition, audition time and date for another uh, label that's in my book. So it's not just like, oh, well, this is a story I've heard. I, I, any story I heard, I tried to find primary source material to back it up. So RCA got involved with Kirshner. They formed Coal Gems as a new label because Coal Picks was shuttered in April of 1966. It was seen that Coal Picks would have been uncooled without the monkey stuff because Coal Picks was a huge money losing debacle for uh, for Columbia Pictures. They, I mean, they lost millions of dollars in 1965-64 money which was like millions and millions of dollars in today's money. So it was in all the trades. They lost all this money. They kept trying to resuscitate it. And the end last gasp was Davy Jones had one of the last charting records. And then they had the Michael Blessing singles, uh, which didn't chart. Um, so they folded Coal Picks in April of 66. They formed Coal Gems, which launched, which was formed in June of 66 and launched in August with last year in Clarksville. But when Kirshner was let go from uh, Columbia Pictures and Screen Gems after his uh, debacle with A Little Bit Me, A Little Bit You and his, you know, uh, friction with the monkeys, Lester Sill took over his job and Lester Sill opened up the label to start uh, recording other artists. Sally Field was one of the first artists to record even prior to Lewis and Clark Expedition. Uh, Lewis and Clark Expedition, of course, Saj Khan. Uh, Rich Little, I think, um, Jewel Akins, there's all these other artists, PK Limited later on, uh, all did stuff. And those were mostly, those sessions, unlike the Monkey Sessions, are wholly owned by Sony Music now. They're not owned through the Monkey's deal. The Monkey's deal is completely separate. The, all the rights reverted back. And in 1969, uh, Columbia Pictures bought another label that was already formed called Bell Records. And there was an announcement that said, uh, they're going to let the Coal Gems deal with RCA lapse. It's going to end in 71, and everything's going to move over to Bell. That's going to be our primary thing. Because they formed another label, too, called SGC, which was Screen Gems Columbia. And that was through ADCO. And they put out uh, the Willoughby's and uh, with the, the NAS and a bunch of other other artists. Oh, that NAS was a part of that? Oh. On SGC, yeah. And yeah, Neil yeah. Sedaka had... Uh, the original version of Rainy Jane was on SGC. So they had other labels like Coal Gems through other, you know, joint ventures with other established, like that was through ADCO, uh, you know, and uh, Coal Gems was an RCA thing, but they said, we're going to do our own thing and it's going to be Bell. And then Bell got dissolved eventually and sort of melded into Arista. And that's how the monkeys ended up over at Arista. Going back to uh, the head era, when that movie came out, it was a unmitigated disaster. 
Uh, I mean, I don't even think it played most markets, correct? That's actually not true, Joe. It did play most markets. It just didn't play for very long. But in my research, I, I'd always believed those stories because Bert and Bob kind of said, oh, my God, what a disaster. They gave up on it right away. I mean, within a week of the premiere, they were done with Head. and They were done with the monkeys. They, 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 there's some evidence to say that people will call their office about the monkeys in late November of 68, just days after Head opened, and say, hey, we want information on um, – monkeys bio we're writing about the monkeys and they say we, we don't handle the monkeys we don't represent them they and why just, would they do that they just saw the handwriting on the wall or they were sick of it or they wanted other to move on to other things all of the above all of what you just said and also when uh michael and david and mickey struck at the beginning of filming for head uh that was really the beginning of the end of the relationship uh the, in certain ways bob rafelson and Bert schneider had uh had had enough of the monkeys and they were going to completely reinvent themselves as independent filmmakers, which they did. The Monkeys was only a means to an end for them. I mean, originally it was just so they could go and make movies. They thought, we're going to do a cash in TV series. This will be very successful. And then we can make art movies, which is what they did. But they wanted to be rid of the Monkeys. But Bert always sort of kept his hand in and was involved with the Monkey stuff. So um, the thing about Head was that Head did play, and it continued to play up through – December 1969, I still have listings for it playing around uh, the country. It played all over in drive-ins. It was double billed with yellow. Yeah, Sonoma. I see it on the dub on the lower lower half of a double bill a lot. In fact, in Jersey, uh, there was Yellow Submarine and Head was a, was a was a show. I have oh yeah, that. yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, and it, it had a good a good shot, but um, a lot of things just sort of caved in on it. Um, you know, it didn't, the monkeys were on a decline, and also uh, the record itself that was driving it, Porpoisong, was immediately taken off the air before it even had a chance to succeed. So um, it, it feels like the plug was just pulled on that really early, and, um, uh, you know, it's a shame because essentially Jack Nicholson and uh, Bob Rafelson were very proud of the movie and continued to talk about it long after into 69, 70. You know, I have all these contemporary press clippings in my book and they're still talking about head greatest rock and roll movie ever made all this other stuff when they're promoting easy rider and five easy pieces they're like have you ever seen head that's a really great movie you know and, and uh and people are saying oh well it's just because the monkeys were in it no one wanted to see it so knowing how esoteric and strange and unaccessible head was they doubled down and did 33 and a third which is probably even more bizarre and less commercial don't you think Totally. I, I, I think complete misstep. I mean, 1968 is a, is a year of just what, you know, intense creativity. I mean, I think Head is an amazing movie, but it's a more amazing for the fact of how strange it is uh, than the actual quality of the filmmaking, uh, the, the narrative, because there is no narrative. You know, then you have Michael Nesmith reporting in Nashville doing basically an album's worth of the most visionary music for the time that mostly doesn't get heard until years later. Uh, you know, D.W. Washburn is a single picked by Lester Sill. I think that, that was a mistake. Porpoise Song is, is one of the most amazing records of his career, gets killed right away. 33 and a third, Jack Good, who is a very inventive and very well uh, TV creator, groundbreaking in England for things like 6.5 Special and Oh Boy, and then in America for Shindig. His bent was always old rock and roll and promoting the old rock and rollers even if you look at if you've seen shindig you've seen it on youtube and things like that you always see the clip of the searchers or you see the clip of the Bo Brummels or the birds or your, the beatles you name your favorite band right if you see a complete episode of shindig those were like three or four songs in an hour-long show which was filled with medleys with other people singing rock and roll songs like donna lauren and bobby sherman and all these, and you know, they were the second tier to uh, this big rock and roll review that was always Jack Good stock and trade. So if you look at 33 and a third and you say, this is so strange. Here are the monkeys, the star of their TV special, but it's got all this other stuff, the Clara Ward singers and this weird dance thing. That's completely Jack Good. The, the monkeys are just special guests on their own starring special. And this is a uh, uh, same formula. He's 
regurgitated over and over and over again throughout the 60s and just but this time in color <laughs> you know uh and so, it's so sad so strange and it's also the the story itself they were originally going to write the script themselves because they thought they were going to write the script for head and then they came back from touring in um, japan and australia and they were like we're tired we're not going to write the script and so whatever art fisher and jack good came up with they were just like okay you know when do we film and by that time peter was like i'm leaving so um they just did it as a contractual obligation there's just not a lot of good feeling in there you know you you can see it on their faces uh they just look completely um you know devastated it's the it's the really the end of the monkeys how was peter able to quit wasn't he under contract that he couldn't he have gotten sued how did he cut no he wasn't going to get sued because he was in he was under contract through Raybert and he was the only person that Raybert liked at that point. So there's a there's a paper trail of letters between himself and Raybert where they said, Peter wants out, fine. You other guys, we hate you. <laughs> you know, essentially, not we hate you, but sort of that But they we were, hate you. They were represented by Jerry Parencio and they formed a new company, actually. Um called like monkeys limited in december 68 and they had all kinds of plans for uh doing new things together without peter and a, a lot more has been made of the feud or dislike between uh michael and peter than is reality in reality they did care and love and respect one another but they didn't they weren't always on the same page i mean in some regards you see their personalities that they wanted the same things but a variation and there's always a power struggle if you see anything with the four of them together, especially later on after the TV series, even a reunion, and the four of them are on stage, they're always trying to step over each other's lines, or I'm going to say this guy's line before he says it. I mean, that's always their energy, is always this intensity, and that's where all the feelings get hurt, and that's where all this other magic kind of happens. But you see, without it being harnessed by Bob Riffs and Bert Schneider, it just goes into, uh, you know, this, this sort of black hole in a way. And that's what happens in 1969 and 70. It's a fascinating journey to go on with them, but it's sad too, you know? Now how does Nesmith wind up uh, bailing? Well, what he does is he, it was, it was uh, said that he bought himself out of his contract, but he didn't actually buy himself out of his contract. He, uh, he signed off on royalties that he wasn't going to collect. Basically, he said, I'm letting go of my rights to a number of things, and I'm also giving away a third of my potential revenue from my next venture, the first national band, back to Screen Gems. And um, if for some reason Screen Gems wants to recall me as one of the monkeys, I'll have to come back. I'm getting a release from my contract to do this, uh, first national band project and, and to be able to sign with RCA. Uh, but I'm, uh, you know, I'm still obligated to the monkeys. And even while he's in the first national band, he's still doing Kool-Aid commercials and, um, not just for film ones, but also print ones. Um, you know, you see them in the, with a the slinger with the uh, Frisbees that's later on. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so he's still obligated to them and, and that was his price to pay to be free to go make music on his own without uh, Mickey and Davey. And so how did uh, changes come about? Well, changes came about because, um, you know, Lester Sill had taken over from Don Kirshner in 1967, and he continued to be the main point person for the Monkees music. And then later in 67, the Monkees had brought over a guy who had worked as a chauffeur for them, Brandon Cahill. And he became quite close to them and um, Lester still recognized that he was capable of running recording sessions and other things. And so Brendan kind of takes over as a apprentice to Lester. And then by 69, 70, he's the music coordinator for the monkeys. When the TV show goes into uh, re airings on Saturday mornings, he's in charge of adding, you know, uh, bye, bye, baby, bye, bye in place of whatever song there and editing it and all that stuff. So um, they thought, well, the monkeys are doing great ratings. Uh, all we need to do is plug these recordings. I mean, if you look at the the, uh, the monkeys reruns at the time when Oh My My came out, um, you look at the three weeks, four weeks around that time, 
they every week oh my my is the replacement song so they had it all timed out they thought we're going to plug these songs but nobody bought those records in any big way i mean i know there were a few people who bought them and they certainly pressed more than one run of changes but um their thought that it would work just like in 1966 when don kirshner programmed last year to clarksville every week when that record came out and all of a sudden it went to number one it didn't work in 69 and 70. nobody wanted those new records by the monkeys however there was a demand for the old records and as ed riley and some of the other people online have found Coljams repressed a lot of these uh, albums and singles and they're quite rare now uh you know with the redesigned labels and like corrected head with jerry goffin's name is spelled right all that stuff happened because the, be of, the beards cover the headquarters beards right? cover is one of those right yeah all that stuff happened because of the saturday morning reruns people wanted the old records but they didn't necessarily want monkeys present or uh you know changes what do the monkeys think of the handmade reissues and things that you've done are they happy that all that unreleased material is out is it the bane of their existence that they think it's overkill what what do they think of that stuff? Well, I've tried not to bring it up too much because I'm behind a lot of it. And sometimes, you know, uh, it's not always the happiest subject. But I know Davey always kind of felt there were certain things, performances, he felt his vocals weren't the best. And he, he knew he didn't have any, um, he had no approval over any of it. So he just sort of said, well, they're your masters, but, you know, I wouldn't have put some of the missing link stuff out. Peter was sort of more open to it. He liked the headquarters sessions and things like that. Um, Michael had liked some of the demo versions that come out, like the demo of Night Times Blue that was on headquarters uh, as a bonus track. And Mickey, I don't think, has spent a great deal of time with it. I mean, Mickey is not a retrospective person. He's constantly always going forward in technology and forward with... Yeah, I can't imagine him sitting and listening to Rosemary outtakes in his living room. No, no. I mean, he doesn't. He he, he doesn't. And um, the times I've tried to play Michael some of the stuff, he's been like, oh, I don't really want to hear that. You know, and I understand that. I mean, it's tough if you were the artist. I mean, for us, we're fans and we think like there's something interesting even in the failures. There's something. Absolutely. I think some of the most fascinating, rewarding things to listen to are the failures. Yeah. But but as the artist, I mean, I know myself. I mean, I, you mentioned I put out records. I'm not putting myself on the level of any of the artists that I love, but even my own music, which has been meaningful to me, at least I got to express myself. There's been certain demos and stuff. I've just thrown in the garbage. It's like, I don't ever want to hear it again. I don't think anybody else should. That's, that's kind of how I feel about uh, the Justice album and the television yeah. special that accompanied it. Well, you know, it's weird. I mean, there are people, and it is part of the monkey's history. Um, at the time. Oh, no, it's a blast to, to see it, but boy, I mean, I was disappointed at the time uh, with it, and um, because I assumed when they were working on the record, it was very closed down. Like they wouldn't let anybody in to really hear what they were doing. They they didn't want any interference. So when it finally arrived on the desk at Rhino, uh, Ward Sylvester, who was managing them at the time, had gone to other labels and said, "Hey, we've got a brand new Monkeys album, the Four Monkeys." for the first time since 1967 together. Eventually they went back to Rhino and they said, look, obviously you guys have the rest of the catalog, you know, and they, they did sell a lot of copies of Justice by today's standards. I mean, they moved hundreds of thousands of, of records on that or CDs. Uh, so it wasn't a failure in that sense, but the monkey's expectation was it was gonna be a new beginning for them because it was so stylistically different, but it wasn't anything a fan like myself would want to hear from them. I thought Davey's songs on it were okay. There were a few other good yeah, moments. I, I agree. Um, I think some of those are the best ones. But they tried so hard to be the Screaming Trees or another group, not the Monkees, that I felt that they lost something with the TV special. Um, I, I just was amazed by the whole thing. The, the funniest story I have about it was when they do that medley of re-recording their hits. They were working on the TV special, and I got a call from Peter, and he said, uh, we had a group meeting, and we wanted access to the multi-tracks for our hits and um, so we could maybe melt them together and we could do new vocals but use the original tracks you know we could have rights from rhino and all that stuff and um i've been trying to get in touch with you because we're way behind our deadline mickey thought he had your phone number but he didn't have it right and then we it was this whole thing about i thought i found it hilarious the four monkeys got together had a conversation that involved me at the time and like 
thinking they can reach out to me. And then I had to explain to Peter, I said, well, you know, we don't have the multi-track for uh, last year in the Clarksville. It's lost. What do you mean it's lost? Well, it's been lost ever since I've been looking for the tapes. It's been gone for, we have, you know, Pleasant Valley Sunday. We have part, at the time, we didn't have all of I'm a Believer. Now we do. Um, you know, we've recovered different things over the years. But yeah, so then they were like, okay, well, we're going to re-record this. So that's my one anecdote about the, the uh, TV special uh, when they are making it. Um. Initially, I wanted to do a tribute to Davey because uh, we've, it's his ninth anniversary since he's, he passed, mm -hmm. but uh, I just didn't make it. Um, what are your memories of David and uh, what, when he passed away, what, how did it hit you? I mean, I, I believe it was a shock for most people. Peter, we knew, had was ill, but with David, I mean, um, I, I saw him 11 days before he passed away. Uh, in fact, uh, let's look at that. days before he passed away I shot that at BB Kings amazing yeah yeah um, well when I first heard about it in the morning before the before it was announced in the press somebody had contacted me that um, knew uh, somebody at the um, medical examiner or whatever and they're like we're trying to confirm this is true and then I was sort of tasked with contacting people and I was just sort of stunned um, and he, Davey had so much energy and it was so, he was so intense if you were with him and knew him and worked with him that I expected for like days and years later that I would pick up the phone and he would be, Andrew, we need blah, 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 you know, like he would, cause it would always be like this intense, like we're going to go here, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, you know, we need this, we need that. So it was, it was really wild, but my, my enduring memory, I've got many memories of David, and he was the first monkey I ever uh, interviewed in 1988. And um, uh, I, I was a very, I was 16 at the time, and he treated me with tremendous respect. And I always loved how he, um, how he treated young people, because as a young person himself, very young when he started out, he, uh, he especially took great uh, great amounts of time to, to make sure that young people were treated fairly. He's a tremendously generous heart. What a giving yes. person he was. Definitely. So my, my big memory of David, though, is I, I, what I learned about him that I didn't learn in all the other years of going to the solo shows, even when you know he, I was an invited guest and hang, hung out with him afterwards or any of these other things. I learned something really fascinating about David uh, in 2011. Um, I guess it would have been um, April uh, of 2011. And I've been thinking about it a lot. We were in Florida and we were rehearsing for the 2011 tour. We were going to go, uh, it, the, the tour opened in May in Liverpool. But before that, David had a yearly annual booking at Epcot Center and he would not move it or change it because he would lose, he thought he'd lose it because monkeys you know, comes and goes, we always end up in a fight, it, it goes away. And this Epcot thing I want to do every year of my life, uh, you know. So he, uh, and sadly, this was the last year he did it because he passed away just before he, the 2012 uh, booking. Um, but so we had to do rehearsals in Florida near Disney World um, for the Monkees tour. And this is their first tour in 10 years. And what I never realized was that David was really the band leader for the monkeys. People look at David and they think he's the least musical monkey. He plays maracas, tambourine, you know. Um, he was the most musical monkey in some respects. 
he he just blew me away. He knew every part from their records because he actually listened to the records. You asked about like m- you know missing links or whatever. David listened to the Monkees records in his car on cassettes and stuff like that for pleasure. He liked the Monkees music. I think he was the the one of the four of them that actually did enjoy it. Beyond well, he's just- the only one who never really tried to distance himself from the fact that he was a monkey. The other three bit, almost bit their leg off to try to distance himself from the image of being a monkey. Davey always embraced it. Yeah. So so when we would be doing the rehearsing, uh, you know, we worked on the set list together, and um, it was a great amount of fun. And and then you know, say we would do it, uh, they would be running through "Can You Dig It," and he'd be no. Nope. That's the wrong bat, a bongo p- pattern. It goes like this. <laughs> he, you know, and and when we were, uh, he had uh, Peter singing. I don't think you know me at all, which he had, he had picked himself off of Missing Links. He goes, I think this would be great. And when Peter initially did it, I said, Oh, you know, he goes, Andrew, don't say anything. I'm I've got this. Let me handle this. I know the vocal support that Peter's gonna like. He had it all figured out. And I was just so very impressed by it because he treated it the way that I would treat it. Uh, you know, I'm musical, but but he really cared about the details. And so that's always been my thing to bring to the monkeys' uh, tables. Like, what you do is great, you guys, but if you just do these other little extra things, it's going to up the level of this just a little bit more. And David had all that. He knew all of it. And um, it was just uh, mind-blowing. The other... Thing in the rehearsals was uh one day he wanted to save his voice because he was singing in epcot and we had like day after day after day of rehearsals and so he mickey would always do a thing like well i don't sing in full voice i don't do the full mickey dolans if we're just running through these songs because i blow up my voice and then i can't sing for the show so david did a uh, sort of a, a similar thing and he was doing she hangs out but in sort of uh, like a Cockney, like Peter Cook, Dudley Moore voice. Like, how old do you say your sister was? Like he did this whole other version of it. <laughs> it was like to save his voice, but he could be so fun. And you watch him also like work out, okay, you you go stand here, Mickey, and I stand here, and then you follow me around. He would be constantly working on bits. And during that tour, he would videotape uh, the shows. And after the show, he wouldn't go to his hotel room and relax. Uh, he would watch the show, give himself notes, and the next day during sound check, he'd be like, "I watched this, uh, Peter. Went after Circle Sky. You know, someone's got to take his guitar. Like this looks bad, and you need to do this, and you need to do that." He was directed the entire thing, and it was unbelievable the level that he got to of uh, attention to detail. He was so invested in it. And he's an amazing artist. And uh, a lot of people don't understand that. They don't know the level of depth that he had in uh, creativity. He's very Absolutely. And I think uh, I think he grew tremendously uh, very quickly because when he joined the Monkees, he was really just had that Broadway uh, experience, that Broadway type singing style. And I think uh, he learned a lot and adapted uh, tremendously to a, a, you know the rock pop. Uh, type vocals that he wound up doing. Uh, you know, I, I know he always singled out It's Hard to Believe as one of his favorite uh, early performances where he was, quote, able to sing it the way he felt it rather than the way somebody told him uh, how to sing it. Right, uh, yeah. His style, yeah. you know, uh, did you, I know you tried to get him to do Star Collector. What was his aversion to doing that song? It wasn't aver- an aversion. I mean, he just, it was too many songs in 2011 that were on the table. Uh, um, you know, he, he, you know, he could also do If I Knew or, you know, French Song or things like that. I mean, I think those, I recently was revisiting those in the final chapters of my book and I re-listened to everything. For They're the amazing. Book. Just, yeah, time and time again, another great vocal from him, great track with Bill Chadwick. Um, but he, um, he was so, he was such an interesting guy, but the discipline that he learned on Broadway that that show showmanship um, that he brought to it that the uh, the other guys uh, only just I mean Mickey learned that because he was on Broadway and Aida too but he had he had that background of real discipline um, and then Michael you know uh, was always about rehearsing and woodshedding and uh, I have to say Peter showed up every tour he would know his parts it didn't matter what song it was 
what record it was. Okay, we're doing Steam Engine. He would he would know all of it off book. He would have it all memorized in his head. He would know all the chord sequences and play, and he would you know he would excel at, at keyboards and he'd have more than he could do. He'd be running around, and Mickey. Every year that he was, he would always be like, "Am I going to do the drums?" And be, "Well, it'd be great if you did this." After everybody else went home for the night, we do be doing rehearsals. Mickey would stay behind at the rehearsal studio with headphones, listening to the monkey songs, relearning to play the drums. I love when he plays drums. Yeah, but he he would do it. He's, I mean, he would put in that time, and you know, so he'd be lear relearning. You told me, you just maybe all that stuff, but. People always think like the monkeys fake group, fake this. They put in the effort. They're so unpretentious, and they really are the real deal because they actually do care about their fans and they care about their music a lot. So, uh, you know, I have tremendous respect for them. Well, Peter kept his energy and his uh, his shtick going right till the very end. I mean, he was. Uh, I mean, he he had the energy of a 25 year old the whole time I had ever seen him on stage always kidding around and doing the shtick with Mickey. I mean, you know, it, it, it was magic. They, they had magic together on stage, really. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That they was, made a lot of people happy. They sure did. And that was, that's been my happiness, too, is to be involved in something that makes people happy. Um, you know, what a great gift in life, not just to be associated with the monkeys, but to know that you're helping to do something that's going to bring other people joy and happiness. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, I remember reading uh, just recently some uh, newspaper, vintage newspaper articles from 69 when they were putting the Sam and the Good Times tour together. Monkeys make a comeback. Right. Um, you know, they were basically, and I think uh, Nesmith was quoted in one of your liner notes as saying by 69 they were dancing on our graves. Yeah. How, how have they endured, you know, basically five decades since then? It's the fans. It's 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 purely the fans wanting it to go on and or to to mean something beyond what the original intention was. Bert and Bob created this wonderful thing. Um, they were driven to success so they could succeed somewhere else. Uh, but still, they wanted success, and they brought to the monkeys a unique thing. It wasn't just a cop off of Richard Lester, which is what they were accused of. They they brought in other parts of cinema. They were deep guys. And then they brought in new people, new blood into the crew, and then you know songwriters. Oh, absolutely! And I think Jerry yeah. Shepard, the editor, uh, deserves a tremendous amount of credit because that was such a vital part of the pacing and the energy of that show was the editing. Undoubtedly, yeah, and he was a wonderful guy. Um, I, you know, I knew him in his lifetime and talked to him about about his relationship. But Rafelson is a very powerful guy. Bert Schneider is an amazing person. Um, and they created this thing of quality in sort of uh, an ephemeral uh, shell, something to be tossed out. But in reality, what you had was something that was really built to last. And so 50 plus years later, that's why we're sitting here talking for an hour about the monkeys and all these little bits and pieces of what makes this thing that brings us all this joy. It, it's a really complex, dense thing, but it's it's made to last. And I'm hoping I see new fans all the time, and that's always the thing. You know, you you can't just think about it through your lens or your experience. You have to think about it. will future generations care about the monkeys, and I hope that's the case. And that's why I wanted the history in my book to be this rather than um, to shortchange this primary history that I came came across, just to squeeze in like, can I put in the 2000s tours and all this other stuff, which is important to me. Some of that's my history. You know, people will say, well, when are you going to write your story with the monkeys? That to me is so inessential compared to 1966, 67, 68, 69, 70. That's the reason why we're still talking about it. It's not because of, you know, certainly good times is amazing, but, but that's not the primary reason. And we're talking about it because of Michael, Mickey, Peter, David, Bert, Bob, you know, uh, Jim Frawl, you know, all these people. Goffin and King, Harry Nilsson, you know, it's the whole laundry list. It's a, it's an astounding. It's an astounding project, one of the greatest projects of the era and and of popular music. Um, speaking again of Davey, uh, shortly after he passed away, 
there was a tribute performance, paying tribute to David. How did that get pulled off? Because I know it was very spontaneous. It wasn't a tremendous amount of planning. Um, how did how did that happen? That show. Well, it's primarily Jimmy Ricciatelli, who was the band leader for the 2011 tour and had worked with David for years. Um, he put together that show and at BB King's and. Um, he was really grieving the loss of David, as we all were, and he wanted a place for all of us to be together and with the fans. And it was a, quite a lengthy show, and so I came out to run uh, video clips and help with some other aspects of it. But it was really his show, and um, you know, I also want to sh show my support to um, the Jones family and and uh, you know, all involved. Admit Mickey and Peter were there, and um, you know, that was that. But it was. It was a strange time. I think we all felt this uh, loss and also a loss of where to put our uh, emotion because, um, you know, we weren't at his funeral and uh, we felt weird about the way he passed and it just felt, it, it felt like a loose end, I think. So, um, you know, and then the 2012 tour with Nesmith coming back, there was the homage to David and, um, you know, <laughs> there was some, some things made about it that made it seem like it was less, less than a tribute to him. I, it, there really was that feeling. Uh, and the, the monkeys all, you know, loved, loved him too. So there's a moment from that, uh, Peter knows it. He knows it. He, he's he's he wasn't he wasn't the singer on that, and he's got, had it better rehearsed. <laughs> I always have to look at those little nuances because they were like, "Well, how was it?" Okay, well, let me be honest with you. You're doing this, and he's. <laughs> but yeah, I just I I'm so used to being critical and looking at every little thing, and um, I can. See well, Peter the, really the, the song they did after that "Daydream Believer." I mean, there wasn't a dry on the house, including Mickey, who visibly broke down during that song. It was so touching. Yeah, Mickey really uh, suffered the loss of David more than the other three um, because they had been so close initially and been through so much uh, together um, up to the point when they did the musical The Point in London in the late 70s in which they had a somewhat of a falling out, um, in which they, you know, they cared about one another, but there was always some friction there. Um, it was tough for them. So you know, Mickey really, really loved David. And, and uh, there'd be so many things like that I'd see on tour uh, with the two of them, um, you know, and, and, and also with, with Michael and Peter, you know, after a show, they wouldn't necessarily go to their separate corners because the rumors are that they didn't like, it's like they would go and sit and have dinner together and chat about different things. I mean, there's always, there's always this camaraderie between the four of them, but it's not exactly how you would imagine it because it's not like it's based off the TV show. All right. Uh, well, the success of Good Times, I think, took everybody by surprise. How did, how do you think, uh, how did that come about? And, and what do you think the magic was to uh, 
why that was such a success. So I remember it was number one on Amazon during uh, the Keswick Theater show. They announced it on yeah. stage. I mean, the fans loved it. I mean, that's what I think we were hoping for when Justice came out. Um, well, I was hoping for it when Pula came out, too. I mean, you know, I, I think that finally the Monkees had done an album that was, uh, you know, uh, paid tribute to their legacy rather than trying to be contemporary. And I think that was a tough thing for them. I mean, I likened it <laughs> to, to when you take your, your pet to the vet and you know that it's for their for their good but it seems like you're torturing them the, the making of, of good times was kind of like that um peter was not happy uh mickey kind of got it and michael initially said no and then came down and uh and then when it came out and was successful they were happy mostly but peter was still like i don't get it um you know there was there was always going to be some loose end to it but i knew it was going to be very successful because I knew that if they play to their strengths and they had every all all cylinders firing, even with the loss of David, that they would ultimately succeed and that it would have a greater acceptance. I think the monkeys have a bigger audience beyond just the little bubble that we're in, that we love everything they do for, for some reason. I think there's this other big audience that we tapped into with good times. And um, obviously a lot of the success of uh, that record uh, is attributable to Adam Schlesinger, his fantastic production, and John Hughes, who, uh, you know, really took over from me and Rhino as far as uh, handling the Monkees catalog and has for many years brought to life a lot of projects that I couldn't get done, uh, specifically Good Times. So, uh, I mean, I was just very lucky to be involved as one of the cogs, uh, the, the, uh, the triumvirate in that, uh, in that situation, uh, but a great deal of credit needs to go to... Uh, to John and Adam, um, because selling a project like that in Rhino to get them to finance a new record, I was totally unsuccessful doing anything like that. I mean, the fact that John did that, I mean, that was a big, big deal. And getting the budget for to have a, a real producer like Adam Schlesinger uh, come in and, you know, there were a lot of little bits and pieces to making a record that you don't think about. And then we went out to get the the, the songs from different people. And, you know, I'd known Andy Partridge since I was a teenager, uh, huge XTC fan, getting getting those songs and hearing demos of other things and, and picking the stuff was just, it was a real dream come true working on that record because it was everything I write about. The, the whole process of putting together a Monkees record, which has always uh, been, except for in the Chip Douglas era, all these different pieces coming together, you know, to create the Monkees, which isn't just one sound and not just one person. It's it's a group effort and to be behind the scenes on that was just like, I've been, I've been training for this my whole life. This is great. <laughs> you know? And when it went to, when it was a success, it was like, yeah, it's not because of me, it's because of the monkeys. And, you know, I always believed in them and I knew that it could happen. Thank God that, you know, Adam made a record that sounded like the monkeys. John talked Rhino into not only putting it out, but promoting it and really supporting it. And the monkeys listened to us and did these songs and, you know, were really produced for the first time in ages. So it was, it was a, a, an amazing moment. I'm, I'm so thrilled to have been a part of. What did Peter have to say when it was successful? Kind of bah humbug. <laughs> um, you know, he, when, um, hang on one second. What are you up to back there? I just adopted two new cats and they're congratulations. Their you know, baby. you know, I'm a fellow cat lover. You know that I know we just had kind of a nightmarish first day together. They've been acting out a lot. And, um, uh, the female, it's a male and a female and the female cat is going around hissing and growling, uh, at everything and everybody right now. <laughs> Very upset. Um, their parent is a musician, uh, Brian Highland. And, uh, some some people might know, but Gypsy you know, Woman, Brian Highland, Gypsy Woman, Joker went wild, uh, Bitsy Bitsy, Teeny Weeny, Yellow Polka Dot, yeah. So uh, he's he's moving uh, across the country, and he couldn't take them. And he he knew I love cats, so I'm taking care of them. But um, it's a tough transition for them because they've lived the same place for eight years, and now they're living uh, somewhere new. And so, mm -hmm. um, but anyway, we were talking about Peter, and. 
Um, when Peter got kudos for stuff like Never uh, Wasn't Born to Follow, um, you know, he was like very pleased. And, you know, uh, as far as my involvement in the record, certain things like originally Mickey was going to sing Wasn't Born to Follow. And I insisted they let Peter do it because there was an issue with another song that Peter wanted on the record, A Better World, that Adam didn't want on the record that I ended up producing. Uh, and I said, you know, as, as a peaceful gesture, I think you should let Peter sing um, Wasn't Born to Follow, and he did a great job of it. I, so, I think so. I, love, I, I think both his tracks are great. Yeah, me too. Me too. Speaking of Peter Tork's solo music, um, uh, you've heard the Peter Tork and or release Acetate, correct? The project yes. that Peter did after immediately after leaving the Monkees? Yes, I, I heard it, and it was quite good. And I only heard it at Peter's house once, uh, and I don't have a copy of it myself. Um, but I was impressed by it. I thought it was good. I, I'm a big fan of Peter's music. Um, I'm so sad that so much of it got lost, uh, you know, the real tapes to Tear the Top Right Off My Head and Ladies Baby. And I, I think all those are great records. Um, recently came across, um, I found stereo mixes of the finished version of Ladies Baby, uh, the final production and Tear the Top Right Off My Head for the first time. So those, and we don't have the, the, the pieces to make a new stereo mix of those. So hmm. we have the multi-track. So it was amazing. I, I turned up some really interesting tapes in this last uh, go round um, doing the book. Uh, it kind of excited me to go back out to look for things and, and um, it's been very, very successful. Now there's not a tremendous amount of stuff from the Pisces album that's hanging around, right? No, there's bits and pieces, but the, the one thing is certain tapes are lost. And another thing is, is that they changed the way they were making records then. They went from four track to eight track. And in the four track days, they would run down a session and they'd play, like for headquarters, they'd play five, six takes, eight takes, 12 takes, 13 takes of a song in a row. And then they take the best version from that uh, and then they'd move that over to another reel and then they'd start overdubbing it or bouncing it down and then adding vocals and then adding overdubs and things like that. With um, Pisces, the the thing changed because they could do all that on one reel of tape. They could just get a track that they like and start overdubbing it uh, because they had these all these open tracks. So they you, you won't get the same process of you know okay well they start out with this and then they go to this and then they go to this like they do on four track or so you have all these other uh, potential alternates. Um, so yeah, it's it's um you know also what struck me when I was doing the book this year was um, how they had done a version of man without a dream for Pisces and they invested a lot of time and money into it. And really, wow. Tapes of that are lost. There's only uh, Peter, uh, Peter, P like a tape of Peter playing a piano arrangement of it um, that exists. Uh, but it's, it would appear that they added all kinds of overdubs. They brought in Louis Shelton. It was all this new information I found for my book that I didn't have before. So what would have happened to something like that? Was it stolen or or damaged or? Um, you know, the way the RCA's uh, sort of protocol was, and they primarily recorded at RCA, would be that a master would get trimmed out of a session reel and put onto what would be called a work part reel. Uh, and so when David went to the studio to sing lead vocals, you know, they wouldn't have to go, okay, well, we're going to put on this reel so we can do uh, you and I, and we're put on this reel so we can do smile and, you know, they would, they would line them all up. So on one night he can come with the headphones. He can say, okay, I'm going to sing this now sing man without a dream now sing, you know, we were made for each other now sing this song and he'd knock them all out. And then, you know, then they'd listen to him and say, okay, replace this vocal, do whatever. So it ultimately got cut out of a reel, put to one of these work part reels. And then that work part reel disappeared. So, how it disappeared, I don't know. People have walked off with reels. You know, I bought back reels from collectors. Uh, it, it's hard to say, or it could be sitting somewhere in storage somewhere. But you know, um, most of the stuff had been returned. We got, you know, Bill Inglot uh, had started the process years ago and brought me into the fold. And we've been, you know, we still talk about. It. We were together a week or so ago, and. Um, I was showing him the the eight track, the one inch eight track that I found for you and I and a few other songs, and he's like, 
wow, you know, after all these years, and how many more, like he goes, is it pro it's probably just like another box or two boxes full of tapes that we're missing. And we've been looking for these things for, you know, I've been 30 years and he's been 40 years on it. So. And you did finally locate the multi-track masters to the changes album, correct? Because I know when Rhino first put it out on vinyl in the eighties, it had been mastered from an LP. Right. Yeah. We do have the first generation stereo tape of that. And where that had ended up was that was at screen gems. Uh, rather than with RCA or, uh, you know, Arista or anything that had ended up in a publishing file. And I found a lot of weird stuff in the publishing files. And there are still tapes that we don't have access to that are in the, um, you know, now it, it was Screen Gems was bought by EMI Music, and then uh, now it's controlled by Sony ATV. So does so anyone's guess where they, you know, the storage space someday probably there'll be some storage locker. They'll say, get rid of it, either toss the trash or it'll end up on eBay or something. You know, you never know. I would think that Nesmith would have had, you know, home demos of him of him doing his own songs, you know, Magnolia Sims and things like that. Uh, There's a any? good amount of, of, of uh, solo demos that he did of his songs for Screen Gems that exist and have been preserved um, that are not from his collection. What he has in his collection, I... I've never been um, given access to. I don't know. I've asked him about it, but um, he doesn't have much to say about it and doesn't, doesn't, you know, I don't know. I know he had a home studio. Uh, and I've also been given some evidence that David had a home studio too. Uh, uh, you know, he certainly had reel to reel deck at home and stuff. And then Mickey was running an actually pretty, pretty full fledged studio, four track studio at his home. Um, from 1968 through the 70s and recording all kinds of interesting things, um, including Davy Jones stuff. And uh, Peter Tork came over and recorded with him. There's all kinds of stuff that Mickey's got that's uh, really interesting. Well, um, I think the breadth of uh, the things we covered in this conversation uh, indicate a little bit of the type of information that Andrew possesses that is going to be in this amazing book. I can't wait to see it when it comes out. Uh, in ending our talk here, we, um, you, you and I can go on for hours. We know that. Um, just uh, if you want to recap uh, how to order the book, to go to beatlandbooks.com. Right. So visit my website, beatlandbooks.com, and it's simply a reservation process, uh, reservation process right now uh, versus you're not making a purchase. You're just reserving a copy of the book, which specific edition you want. And based on that reservation, I'm making the books, uh, you know, in the next month or two, they're going to be made. They're going to be shipped into a fulfillment center. Uh, and when the books are ready to be distributed, um, I will send you an email at that time, not when you make your, your reservation. When it's ready to be billed, I'll say, hey, you know, your book for $75 or whatever else this is it if you live in the state of California and I'm in California, you have to pay sales tax. These are your options for shipping. And you know, we don't even know the weight of these books right now. We've gotten some rough estimates, but we're about a week off from getting the dummy books where we can actually weigh them out and get, you know, okay, this is what it's gonna cost through the post office or UPS or FedEx. We, I, you know, I can't even tell you that because the book has kept growing and growing and growing. Um, so it's people- like the blogs. Now, that's why we're just doing reservations because we're not, we can't guarantee anything until we absolutely have the facts. So uh, go to Beatland Books and we're going to keep updating it. And uh, eventually there'll be a shopping site there and you'll be able to purchase the book when it's ready, probably around May. All right, Andrew, I can't thank you enough for being uh, guest number one here on the Monkey's Pad podcast. Uh, good luck with the book, and uh, I'm sure we'll see each other uh, here again down the road, uh, maybe when for the sure. Nesmith Sings, uh, Dolan Sings Nesmith uh, project comes and then, out. And the Nesmith Sings Dolan's. Doing that, <laughs> but I, no, would, I, I would, what would I pay for Mommy and Daddy sung by Michael Nesmith? Well, we hope to be back out with um, Michael and Mickey and the Mike and Mickey show when when the universe allows it and thank you joe for your help and contributions to keeping the monkey's flame alive all these years it's been invaluable to me to be able to tap into your uh, resources and your memories uh, along with all the other great monkey authors so thank you again and thank you for having me on my pleasure andrew take care and take care of those cats for me i will 
Well, that concludes episode number one of the Monkey's Pad podcast. I'd like to thank Andrew Sandoval for being our very first guest. If you like the broadcast, please like and subscribe. I'd also like to thank Michael Pomerico for his technical assistance on this show. And if you like 60s music, you might want to visit our other podcast on YouTube called Reuven with the Rascals. Okay, we'll see you next time.